Palliative Care, Clinical Vignette by Dr. David Cassavant. The following clinical vignette utilizes specialized trained actors to portray the patient and family members. It's designed to highlight common challenges encountered in the delivery of palliative care and present approaches to those challenges. We see the physician in this vignette approach treatment and end-of-life decision-making as an integral component of her ongoing care of this patient and his family. She utilizes the family priorities to craft the goals of care and then continues to care for the surviving family members. Scenario 1, Recognizing Opportunities for Advanced Care Conversations. Thomas Martin is a 19-year-old young man with cerebral palsy who communicates non-verbally. He is fed via G-tube, he uses a wheelchair, and has undergone a spinal fusion and hip osteotomies. He has a seizure disorder that has been stable for many years, but has worsened acutely in the past months, requiring frequent hospitalization and causing a sharp decline in his interactions with family and his ability to function. In the first scene, we meet Thomas's sister, Natalie, who is finishing up a scheduled well visit with her primary care physician, Dr. Harris. Dr. Harris uses this routine healthcare interaction to inquire about Thomas's condition and uses it as an opportunity to invite his parents to a discussion of long-term goals of care. All right, we're all set. You look pretty healthy. The only thing is you need one vaccine today. Okay. So what we'll do is the nurse will come and bring that in, but we'll have your mom come back in first. I think she's on her way. Okay. Um, and uh, we'll be all set. Hey. Hey, Ma. Hi. So she looks healthy. Um, the only thing she needs is one vaccine, um, and the nurse is going to come in in a second to get it, and then she's all set for another year. Great. Thanks. By the way, how's Thomas doing? Oh, you know, same old thing. It's busy, but it's all right. Oh, come I on. No, he's been in the hospital like every week this month. Yeah, he has been in. I mean, you've yeah, seen the he's records. Been he's been in more than he used to be. No, but it feels like every day he's got a different infection. It's like he's got like a, what, a lung infection and a urine infection and bacteria in his blood. And his seizures are just getting worse and worse. So it's just... Things have been a little tougher lately at home. I mean, it's yeah. every visit's a little bit longer than the last one. Yeah, know? and no one can come to see my games because everyone's always dealing with Thomas. And then he's got this, this stupid BiPAP thing, which is just ridiculous. I mean, he's just terrified when it's on him. Mm -hmm. You could see it in his eyes. He just has no idea what's going on, and it's being used more and more. And I just wish... I just wish there was something that could be done for him that wasn't awful and terrifying for him. Yeah, I think he, I agree with you, he doesn't like the BiPAP. It doesn't, he feels very constrained and it's hard for him. Mm. But, you know, it's, it is what it is. Mm. Well, you know, it's, it's actually been quite a while since I've seen Thomas here in the office um, because he's been in the mm -hmm. hospital so much. And I think it would make sense to have him come in so I can see him, see how he is right now, but also have your husband come so we can talk together about how he's doing and what kind of care we need to be providing for him and all of that. Do you think that would be useful? Yeah, I think that would be a good idea. Okay. I think that would be great. Yeah. yeah. Why, don't, why don't we try and set something up in the next week or two so okay. we can do that? That would be great. Thank you. You're welcome. Scenario 2, Advanced Care Planning. In this scene, Thomas's parents meet with Dr. Harris to discuss Thomas's recent illnesses and his change in level of function. The following features of the discussion are noteworthy. Dr. Harris maintains an active listening style during the meeting and uses a scheduled appointment for the discussion to avoid interruptions from her other clinical duties. She determines the family's sense of the appropriate level of involvement for Thomas in the decision-making process. She asks about the family's understanding of Thomas's illness and utilizes affirmation and clinical summary in her discussion. She identifies specific worries and fears, then acknowledges the family's past successes in caring for Thomas. She has chosen a period of clinical stability for the discussions of trade-offs between therapies or conditions that would be either desirable or unacceptable. And lastly, she summarizes the goals and priorities she and the family have come to agree on as a basis for planning Thomas's care. Mm. 
Hey. Hi, Bob. Hi, Jan. How are you? Good. How Hi, are Doctor. You? Hey, Thomas. How are you doing today? Thanks for coming in to uh, talk. Thanks for being able to find the time. We appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. I thought it would be a good idea for us to talk and um, really talk about how Thomas is doing. When I saw Natalie last week, you know, we discussed very briefly the fact that he's really been sick a lot recently, been in the hospital a lot, and his, um, his condition is not really quite the same as before. So I thought it would be a good idea to, yeah. to really mm -hmm. tease that apart a little bit and, and, and talk about what, what's the most important things for um, helping him going forward. Sure. Do you think he should be here? I was thinking it might be best for Thomas if we talk to him later on our own. We have our own sort of way of talking with him, and I think that I just don't want to upset him or confuse him. Is part, that... part of me would like him to stay, but I think you're right. I okay. Think, yeah. So if Janine is outside. I'll just take him out, and he can. Great. I think that Great. makes sense. Yeah. Okay. See you, buddy. Go see, Janine. see you later. So we wanted to talk a little bit about um, Thomas and his illness and um, how he's progressed over the course of the last, you know, several years, really. Um, and I thought it might be useful to just try and start with talking about what your understanding is of his illness at this point and where, where you see him in terms of his function. Um. Well, his function is not what it was. I mean, he's, he's just not, um, he just doesn't bounce back like he did. No, it's, so it feels like his, he can't do the same things he used to be able to do and sort of, um, and I feel like there's more seizures during the day um, and just sort of more, everything's uh, harder. Um, mm. He doesn't. He just struggles. It just seems to be a never-present struggle for him. I, I, I mean, I, I guess I'm trying to understand what his quality, how he's doing now. I mean, he doesn't, the things that he used to enjoy, he used to sit and watch his favorite movies, and he doesn't do that anymore. He doesn't, um, they, he doesn't seem to notice them anymore, and he can't sit in his chair for very long. Mm -hmm. And... Um, because he used to like to look out the window. I, he used to watch the birds all the time. He loved to watch. He, we have a couple bird feeders. He doesn't seem connected to that mm -hmm. anymore. It's been ages since he's gone to school, and that's just not... I mean, it's important to him. Mm -hmm. It's... It's It's just not... He goes into the hospital, and then it's, you know, how long, and so he doesn't have the rhythm that he used to have mm -hmm. in his life. Mm -hmm. And then he's not sleeping and it's just, he doesn't, he just doesn't have, he just doesn't, he doesn't have his life mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. He actually has a, did have a pretty good sense of humor, mm -hmm. I thought. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't see it. Anymore. Well, back when I fir first met Thomas and met you, you know, we had conversations about, you know, what we expected his course to be over time, and um, that there potentially would be a time where we would start to see some decline in his function and his abilities. And it, it really seems like over this past year, we've, we've we've gotten to that point where there's a really noticeable difference, and we're we're in a different place than I think we were yeah. were back then. So so I do think it's, you know, we want to ha have some conversation about you know what your goals are for his care and, and what we should be thinking about you know the next time he might need to come into the hospital yeah because the I mean and one of it is coming into the hospital whenever he's here it's so much har harder for him and he comes into the hospital he's here longer and then he gets home and it's harder for him and I just feel like we're we're I mean he's just not if we keep coming, it's being in the hospital mm -hmm. again and again, and nothing gets back to normal, and he doesn't, and it's tough on Natalie. It's, mm -hmm. yeah. 
I'm sure it's changed the family dynamics and yeah. the structure and how much attention she Just, feels she's getting. Yeah. She's a teenager, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, is there anything in particular you're worried about or that you're fearful about for him? I think the thing that I keep coming back to is he's he's happiest at home. He's happiest with the people around him who love him and give him a sense of safety or security or something mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. that sort of helps him and that is true he's it's he's happier at home yeah I mean mm -hmm. it's just every time after he gets out of the hospital even when he's having a hard time it's there's just something in him that that there's, seems more at ease so mm -hmm. I, I guess what whatever we decide that feels like that's critical mm -hmm. that we make sure that he's comfortable and and I don't. I want him to have some level of happiness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think he needs to be around the, the people who love him. And um, yeah. I feel the same way. I, I, I don't want things that are going to be painful or difficult for him that aren't that aren't getting us to a better place for him to mm -hmm. get something that's going to make life easier for him. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. No, absolutely it does make sense. Yeah, he suffered too much, I, way too much. And, uh, Last time I was in and he was looking at me and he was hooked up to me and I just thought, he was looking at me like he wanted, he wanted me to, to take care of him and she's, so I just need, I just, need to understand what that looks like mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She's been so devoted, it's, it's incredible. Yeah, and, and you have been, and, and Thomas knows that, which is, I, I think, important for you to, I know you do know that, but to just state again that he does know that. You provided amazing love and compassion and care for him. <laughs> it's, it's mostly her. <laughs> So it, it really sounds like we're in a different place than we were before, that this is a definite change in, mm -hmm. in the course of Thomas's illness. And um, um, I think it is important for us to really try and as, as firmly as possible um, identify what we want to do for Thomas. Um, and I think it's important to do that now while he's home and um, not in the middle of a, a, an acute illness, yeah. um, rather than when we're and he's in the hospital and sick and or, mm -hmm. you know in the ICU as yeah. he's been in the yeah. past. So how would you think about the balance between the things that we can do for Thomas in the hospital and the benefit that you get from that in terms of uh, improving his quality of life? Looking at the last couple of times he's been in the hospital, there's a, there are a lot of interventions that we do. He has been intubated in the past and um, on a ventilator. Um, and when that happened years ago, he bounced back and was back at his usual level. I'm not quite so sure that if that were to happen now that he would be able to come back from that. I guess that's what I keep trying to understand and trying to figure out every time we're in the hospital, sort of what's the, is this a... When do we stop? Well, and is this a little thing? Is this something that is just, um, that's going to make him, you know, that it's n not really hard on him. It's not really, that that's going to make him better. You know what I mean? When he has pneumonia and, you know, we know what to do and we sort of know the, the process and as long as it doesn't get too bad, we're okay. But so I'm, it's knowing what's the, like you said, trade-offs, sort of what's the, I think it's is it does it have any long term uh, is it is it helping him mm -hmm. or is it just i don't know but I, prolonging I don't, something mm -hmm. i don't I know mm -hmm. i know i struggle with uh, this is part of it keeps we keep i think we keep thinking there's a little hope that he's going to bounce back yeah. mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. so we should do this because mm -hmm. he will bounce back but we know, I think I, I think I know now that he's not going to. Mm -hmm. Well, it's that, yeah, it's sort of that. What's the, 
if we do this for him, is he going to get back to sort of where he was just before it, or is it, or is it just taking us further down the, the path? And am I putting him in pain for, mm -hmm. I don't know what? And is that for me, for us, or for him? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We don't want him to be alone. Mm -hmm. I don't want a lot of extra stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't. I mean, I. I I think that's for us, not for him. One thing we both worry about is we don't want him to have pain, to go mm -hmm. through this constant battle with struggle, with pain. And it sounds like from what I hear you saying that you're really very focused on making sure Thomas is, is, is comfortable, <laughs> that if there are things that we can do to improve his condition <clears throat> or um, things that we can do to, you know, reverse an, right. an illness. Right. You know, so obviously I mean, if he's sick and has a pneumonia needs antibiotics, yeah. that we would do that, that if he needs right. oxygen or needs an IV and some fluids to, you know, to get him through an illness, that that's, mm -hmm. you know, very important. Right. Mm -hmm. That if he needs pain medicines, make sure he's not in pain and, 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 and not in discomfort. But in terms of more invasive things, like if his, if his breathing were to stop and he were, you know, couldn't breathe on his own or if his heart were to have, you know, difficulty beating on its right. own, that... Um, you know, that's a very different level yeah. of intervention. Mm -hmm. And so sort of based on what you described to me as your desires for Thomas, um, and also the fact that I've known you for mm -hmm. so long and, and have, have, have seen uh, the, the change in Thomas over this time, my recommendation would be to make it clear that you would not want to have things that are likely to cause increased discomfort and pain mm -hmm. um, and not help Thomas, such as using a ventilator or or using CPR are things you wouldn't want to do and that would be and that would be my recommendation is that you know uh, in terms of Thomas's ultimate condition and outcome he's not it's, it's not reversible and we've seen this decline over this period of time so that would be my recommendation based on what I know about you and what you've just described to me as your goals for Thomas and that seems right right mm -hmm. I mean I just want to make sure we're not Because he's, because there is a, a decline, right? I mean, we're not, we're not imagining. No, you're not imagining it. No. Okay. Mm -mm. And it's as I said, it's not unexpected. From the time Thomas was little, knew that it, eventually there was going to be some decline at some point, but not really aware of when that yeah. would be. And yeah. I, but I think we're definitely in that phase mm -hmm. now. Okay. Um, Seems okay. like it just came in all of a sudden to yeah. me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I. I I, I think we should actually, in a very thoughtful way, um, really write down what uh, desires are for Thomas in terms of interventions and care. Um, there's a form that we use uh, called a MOLST form. It really is a form that tells uh, healthcare providers and others what types of life-sustaining treatments you do and don't want um, mm -hmm. for Thomas. Um, and I think it's important to do this now while he's, you know, at his baseline and he's home um, and not in a crisis situation yeah. mm -hmm. um, in the ICU. So that we've really, mm. you know, very thoughtfully, yeah. um, just as you've done now, considered what are the benefits and, and sort of drawbacks of various, of various treatments. Yeah. So I do have the form here and we can take a look at it and um, okay. Okay. we'll go through it and, and, and both sign it. Scenario 3, Bereavement Care. Several months after meeting with Dr. Harris, Thomas is admitted to the hospital with increased seizure activity and worsening respiratory distress. He is minimally responsive to his family. His seizures decrease with additional anti-seizure medications, but he remains minimally responsive. The inpatient medical team and Dr. Harris meet with the family. They explain that this condition represents a worsening of his baseline neurologic disorder rather than an intercurrent illness. Together, they decide Thomas should go home with hospice care support to focus on his comfort. They stop his BiPAP and Thomas goes home with the MOLST form and symptom management plan in place. In keeping with the family's needs and wishes, Dr. Harris calls several times and makes a home visit. One week following discharge, Thomas dies comfortably at his home, surrounded by his loving family. 
The last scene occurs approximately two months after Thomas's death. As part of her continued care for Natalie, Dr. Harris meets with Natalie to discuss her physical and emotional state since her brother's death. The following features of the discussion are noteworthy. Dr. Harris discusses the broad range of grief symptoms after the loss of a loved one. She assesses Natalie's coping strategies, supports her, and educates her around grief symptoms. She identifies available psychosocial supports that Natalie may access at any point that she or Dr. Harris feel is appropriate. Dr. Harris highlights the family's strength and Natalie's past successes in supporting Thomas and uses these to reassure her that she will continue to have successes in the present and in future challenging situations. Hi, Natalie. How are you doing? Hi, Dr. Harris. Uh, thanks for making an appointment. I'm glad you called to set up some time for us to talk. No, thank you so much for making the time. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it, it, it's been about two months now since Thomas passed away, and um, obviously a lot has happened since that time. But how, how are you doing? How are you coping? I'm doing okay. I mean, it's, it's hard. It's weird. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so um, that when it came down to it, um, we were able to have him at home and he was able to not be in a lot of pain and to be quite peaceful towards the end. So it almost feels a little weird to feel this bad. It wasn't, it was almost like the end was better than what he had been going through before with all the seizures and all those things, so. And I mean, I think the fact that he was peaceful and comfortable, you know, is a testament to you and your whole family in terms of thinking about what is in Thomas' best interest and what you wanted for him and what you felt he would want for himself. Um, so it was really important for everybody to think about that and, and plan for that. And so I think that helped that process to go as smoothly as it, as it possibly can. But obviously you still have your memories of him. Yeah, I miss him a lot. Yeah. I just really miss him. Mm -hmm. I mean, on our way here, we drove past the softball field, and I just kept thinking of when he used to come to the games with my mom and my dad. And he would just be so excited. Mm -hmm. And like, when I would get up to bat, he would just be, you know, getting so rowdy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, I just, uh, I don't know, I'm having, a, I'm having good days, and then I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not usually this emotional about it. Mm. How are you doing with just your other daily activities? Are you able to sleep okay? Are you getting through the night? Uh, yeah, at first it was a little hard just because it was so quiet. I think not having his machines going on in the background, um, not having the suction machine. Um, and it's, it's weird because <laughs> when they were on, I hated those machines. Mm. I hated that suction machine. And um, part of me almost misses it, which is weird. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about? Eating. Are you eating yeah. meals every day? Yeah. No, I'm, <laughs> Dr. Harris, I'm fine. I'm okay. <laughs> I'm okay. I'm eating. I'm sleeping. Mm -hmm. I'm hanging out with my friends. I'm starting practice next week. So, so you've got some things you're looking forward yeah, to. Yeah, making absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Because sometimes grief can really be overwhelming, and you can get very depressed at times. And, and again, that's normal, but if it seems like it's staying for a long period of time or you're not finding things that make you happy, then it would be important to, to know that and to maybe you know, do a little bit more um, to manage that. I think I'm doing okay. okay. I mean, it's hard when I walk into the garage and his chair's still there, or his bedroom's the same. That's hard, but it's also sort of comforting because mm -hmm. it reminds me of him. Do you feel like you have other people that you can talk to? Yeah, um, my friends are always around, and they love Thomas so much, too, so um, it's been mm -hmm. good to be able to talk to them and to talk to my mom and my dad a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think if, you know, I'm, I'm always happy to talk with you at any time, and if that's helpful to you, you know, you, know you can call me any time. Um, but if at any point you thought you needed, you know, to talk to someone professional like a counselor, you know, we could certainly set something up like that doesn't seem like you need that right now, but well, just to let you know that that's, that that's something that's available if, you, if you're interested. But what you're going through is, 
you know, is, is not unexpected. And as I said, you don't really ever get over it, but you get to a point where it, um, you fit it into your life and, um, and, you, and you are able to um, put it in its proper perspective and have those good memories. You are, you are a great sister for Thomas. I hope you know that. You're his defender and his, and his champion, so, and he knew that. Thank you, Dr. Harris, that means a lot. Sometimes I don't always feel like I was the best sister, because sometimes I'd get short with him or I'd get frustrated because he was getting all the attention, and so I didn't always feel like I was the best sister. Mm -hmm. Well, you were. As we all get angry at the people we love <laughs> periodically, so, and that's not gonna be any different with Thomas, but you know, you've, you've been an amazing sister to him. And um, uh, as I said, I think both he knew that and your parents know that, and, and I knew that as well. Yeah, you were so great. He, he liked you so much, so. Mm -hmm. You've just been really important to our family, so I wanna thank you for that. Oh, you're quite welcome. Let me give you a hug. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Harris. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback.